cultural Marxism is officially mainstream. Is there any way to swim against the tide? And Gavin McInnes joins us to talk no wanks. Wild program coming your way. You're watching On The Hunt. What a week, Ontario. Kathleen Wynne's hot off the press provincial budget not only decreed cap and trade tax, which will inevitably hasten the move of many towards energy poverty, but in a totally unexpected move from way out in left field, Premier Wynne's Liberal government also announced free university and college education for the needy. So, in celebration of us going totally broke for the sake of trees and gender studies, I thought we could have a little chat about a little something that some call socialism. Now, despite what you might think, socialism actually isn't dead. It's just in disguise and doing pretty well. Now, I'm not just talking about parts of the globe like Latin America, North Korea, China, Vietnam, Russia, and much of the EU, where socialist henchmen are totally unconcealed in their control. I'm referring to us, right here in North America, where Marxist magicians have gained control of our culture, while their oppression faces almost zero opposition. How? Their rebrand has been totally brilliant. See, today we don't call socialism socialism anymore. We call it social justice and progressivism. Now, that's not to say that every social justice warrior is keen on communism. Most of them are just the useful idiots Vladimir Lenin talked about. Nonetheless, their social justice simply teaches the failed socialist policies of yesterday. Now, when you think about it, the whole movement can be basically boiled down to this. Taking from one and giving to another in a system where man relies on and eventually actually desires government care from cradle to grave. Now, if you're under 50, you likely have little idea of just how evil socialism is. So here are the Coles notes. Socialism destroys everything in its path, beginning with morality and the family unit, inevitably creating chaos and manufacturing victims in need of a government solution, i.e. optimal conditions for a Stalin or a Hitler to come to power. Its goal is not big, but gigantic government, which can take things by force, including human life, while its death toll is some 135 million in this century alone. 500 million if you include abortion, by the way. But, but hold on, North America is so far from Hitler's National Socialism or, or Stalin's Soviet Socialism, and where exactly do I get off on Lincoln's social justice warriors to all this? It's actually pretty simple. The Marxist plan for North America, which has been unfolding since the 1960s, is really, really well documented, and we're right on track. Admittedly, it'd take all night for me to walk through the meticulous cultural Marxist connections that face us every day, but here's the general idea. Marxism stands against the bourgeois family unit because the family unit is the ultimate roadblock to the statist movement. Now, it's that very idea which has been the chief focus for key influencers within Western socialist thought, namely the Fabian Socialist Society, the Frankfurt School, and individuals like Antonio Gramsci and Saul Alinsky. These Marxist movers and shakers shared the vision of an incremental cultural revolution, so incremental people wouldn't even realize it was happening. A revolution which targeted the family and religion by overloading education and media with their own, employing Hitler's divide and conquer through prejudice methods right along their way. They wrote about undermining morals through music, literature and art, infiltrating especially the youth. And hey, we women, yeah, we weren't exactly off the red radar. The Communist Party USA devised a plan to optimize the feminist movement, aided by books like The Feminine Mystique. They sought to apply a lens of victimhood before the gaze of everyday American housewives, who, by the way, when you think about it, are probably the most fortunate creatures on the whole face of the planet. Hey, speaking of planet, Marxists were actually into the whole green crusade long before it was cool. I mean, think about it. Societal fear of an environmental crisis, which includes getting the heebie-jeebies about energy's cheapest forms like coal, 
Yeah, enter all powerful government who can provide the solution all the while obtaining or growing control of energy sources at an inflated cost to the consumer. Yeah, that simple equation made environmentalism a cornerstone of Marxist theories well before Al Gore's global Marshall Plan. It actually dates all the way back to the 1960s, while its roots are as a movement against free market capitalism. It's communism in disguise. So in sum, what these radicals wanted was something totally un inconceivable at the time in which they theorized. A discreet, divide and conquer movement which undermines church and family while exploiting education, environmentalism, and feminism, transforming every man, woman, and child into victims for statist advantage. Sound familiar? Yeah, the so-called progressive social justice movement is, again, just a phrase for the failed policies of socialism. Problem is, yeah, cultural Marxism has actually become endemic. Uh, look no further than the Oscars, the crown jewel of Hollywood, wherein divide and conquer racism was its very theme this year. We literally awarded groups for bashing the church and traditional family institutions. And we provided standing ovations for the radical mouthpieces of environmentalism and feminism alike. Now look, I get it. Western civilization is facing threats on every front, seemingly larger than a moral deficit and a culture of victimhood. Militant Islam, open borders, a frail economy, China on the rise, these are just a few things. But, but it's cultural Marxism that will rot us from the inside out. Because if we are both unable to identify evil, while at the same time forfeiting our means to combat it, we will surely be swallowed up by the super state, while no experiment throughout all of human history has ever seen that turn out in favor for the masses. So how do we push back at the current progression of things? My two cents, pay attention to what your kids are learning in school and watching on TV. Arm yourself with facts and call out social justice BS for what it really is. Assume responsibility for yourself and your household in this information war. Because they're right. The family unit is the only thing that will stop this creeping revolution towards state control. Stay with us. Gavin McInnes joins us to talk about why he's with the Old Spice Guy. That's after this short break. I love Alberta. I've lived here my whole life and I'm proud of it. I'm proud of our free market, pro-business, low-tax, do-it-yourself attitude. And now, I'm watching my province get destroyed. We've all had hints of the NDP's radical views in the past, but no one actually thought they'd ever run this province. Not even them. And now they are. And the worst is yet to come. I give my sad forecast for Alberta in my new ebook, The Destroyers, Rachel Notley and the NDP's War on Alberta. Want to have dinner with Faith Goldie? Grab a drink with Brian Lilly. Talk politics with Ezra. You can do it all on the Rebel Cruise. This November, join us for great debates, gourmet meals, and gorgeous scenery as we sail from Fort Lauderdale around beautiful Caribbean islands. It's an intimate week where you can really get to know your favorite Rebel personalities and meet other Rebel lovers too. Space is limited, so visit therebelcruise.ca to sign up now. Oh, 
Welcome back. That was ultimate bro Terry Crews. Now, I say ultimate bro with some confidence because Crews has, well, he's done it all. He's played in the NFL. He's the star of the TV comedy Brooklyn Nine-Nine and one of the macho men in the guy flick The Expendables and is now commonly featured on one of the Old Spice commercials like the one you just saw there. But this week, Crews actually came under fire for posting this on his Facebook page. The subject is dirty little secret. And, you know, for years, 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 my dirty little secret was that I was addicted to pornography for years. Now, most of you who are on Facebook are using the internet. And I, it's kind of crazy because this thing has become a problem. I think it's a, uh, you know, a worldwide problem, but pornography, um, it really, really messed up my life in a lot of ways. So in a series of about three videos, Cruz went on to talk about how his whole life and his three decade long marriage was nearly shattered by a problem with which he wrestled personally, pornography addiction. So rather than bring some of my square Bible thumping friends to talk to you about the evils of porn and masturbation, I thought I'd bring in a man so manly that he actually made a movie teaching other men how to be men. Gavin McInnes, he's on the hunt with us now. Hey, Gavin, how you doing? I'm great. How are you? Very well, thanks. All right, so I brought you on because uh, anyone who watches your show knows that you're a big advocate of something called No Wanks. Tell us a little bit about what this business is about. Well, it's funny how we kicked out all these traditions, and Canada is especially guilty of this. Canada is sort of like a, a blank slate where you go, love doesn't exist, or we can have nine husbands, or we always want to reinvent the wheel in Canada. So part of that was get rid of, you know, all the taboos about masturbation, and I was part of that too. And by the way, pornography and masturbation are inseparable when we talk about this. It's not like anyone masturbates without pornography or watches pornography without masturbating anymore. And we're predominantly talking about men. Um, so you have to quit both at the same time. And what we discovered accidentally is after kicking out the tradition of masturbation is bad, we realized, oh, actually, it is bad. And we started with every, boiling it down to five days, and then we went 10 days. Now the rule with no wanks is you cannot partake in that act more than once every 30 days. And the first few days are pretty rough. You uh, have to avoid certain uh, websites and certain Instagram accounts. But I'll tell you what, we've all discovered, I'm talking about a hundred of us, we've all discovered that life is just better. If you're single, it gets you off the couch and over to a party where you meet chicks. If you're married, it makes you more involved with your wife, especially if you've got a lot of kids. You don't feel like horsing around after a busy day, but you end up having to. And it's made my marriage 100% better. And this is a little more ambiguous, but... You're just a better guy. Like you sing in the shower, you strut down the street, you feel like a more quality human being. And now, Gavin, I have to do a little disclaimer here because, of course, we're both Catholics. So I, I, I believe in sexual freedom, but I've just got a different idea of freedom than a lot of people, which is to say, you know, you're freest when you're in the sacrament of marriage. Okay, now that I've got that disclaimer out of the way, I'm happy that you say that there's no separation between pornography and masturbation because I think that is so true. And, you know, there have been studies about it. There have been testimonials. Guys will say, look, once I've been so saturated in pornography, I use it every time that I masturbate, that even when I want to get away from that, these images have basically been ingrained in my memory that I, I, I can't help but uh, defer to them as opposed to use my own imagination when it comes to romance, sex, etc. And you know, what, what kills me, Gavin, is people will be like, oh, you know what, uh, uh, watching pornography, it, it doesn't really affect the way that I think. If I watch HGTV for 20 minutes, Gavin, all of a sudden I'm sitting on the couch thinking about renovating my house, even though I had no intention to renovate whatsoever. When you are saturated in something for a prolonged period of time, 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes, maybe more than that, let alone every day, it's bound to have an effect on your imagination and your life. What do you, because you mentioned how it's improved your marriage, basically being part of this No Wanks Club. What do you say about the role of pornography and masturbation when it comes to just romance? Well, Tracy Morgan actually has a funny bit about this where it sort of brainwashes you into thinking your wife is a prostitute. So when she's finally ready, you're like, well, why aren't you wearing lingerie and uh, thigh high boots? What are you doing? Where's your riding crop? It gives you a distorted view of reality. And by the way, I think it's worth noting that we're not coming at this from a Puritan way, and I have no problem with the conservative right who is coming at it from that, but we're coming at it from a different angle here. We grew up with porn. It's never been bad to us. When we say it's bad for you, it's more like an ex-junkie saying heroin is bad. So mm. we've been there and we've tried it. It's not because we're uptight. It's because we've realized it's bad for you. And, and 
There's a great book called uh, Your Brain on Porn, and this guy does a lot of TED Talks, and he explains the science of it, which is your brain sees you with 10 eights a day, and it doesn't know that they're on a porn site. It thinks you're fornicating with these women. So your brain goes, oh, you're clearly Attila the Hun. You're having sex with the prettiest girls in every village. I'm going to keep releasing dopamine because this is a good pattern. You're spreading your seed all over, over Eurasia. And what it, your brain doesn't know that this is all fake. So then when you go back to reality, your brain goes, wait, you're back to with your, your girlfriend? She's a six. What are you doing? So you're actually literally brainwashing yourself into getting addicted to porn. And it's, it's really unhealthy because it's not reality. And, and the kind of sex you're having in this porn isn't real sex. And I, what I want to know is, I wish there was a way you could evaluate, how many marriages have fell, fallen apart because of porn. How many relationships have fallen apart? Because now when your girlfriend threatens you to, to quit or it looks like it's falling apart, your brain goes, well, I'm still Attila the Hun. I'm still having sex with every woman in the village, so go ahead, bye. Women have a, a will to be loved. They do have a will towards romance. And when you look at the pornography industry, um, the people who are shooting this stuff are not interested in where your hands are, but frankly, interested in the act of penetration itself. And I think that what we've done is we've totally removed imagination and romance from um, the most frequent sort of sexual act that, that men and a lot of women too are getting, namely in self-pleasure and their the, the involvement of per, uh, pornography in that. Gavin, we're going to leave it there. You've been awesome. I know this is a tough, tough topic for a lot of folks who, uh, who watch us, but frankly, we're in a culture war, and this is something intimate. I think it affects uh, really the very root of our entire society, which is man and woman at, at, at the, the, the head of the family structure. So thank you so very much, Gavin. Thanks for having me. Bye. <laughs> All right, folks, stay with us. Your week's top headlines. That's next. Looking for the perfect gift? Did you know the Rebel.media has a store? Make a statement with a t-shirt. Have your morning coffee in a Fearless Travel coffee mug. There's even an Ezra Levant bobblehead. It's a one-stop shop for the perfect gift. And don't forget to pick up something for yourself. Go to the Rebel.media slash store to find out more. Ontario residents are being hosed on electricity prices. The latest Auditor General's report says we've been overcharged by $37 billion over the last several years. That works out to nearly $2,800 for every man, woman and child. Why? Mismanagement and bad policy choices from the Ontario Liberals. It's going to cost us billions more in coming years. Energy Minister Bob Shirelli won't take responsibility. He's lashing out. It's time for Bob to go. If you agree, go to firebob.ca. That's firebob.ca and make your voice heard. Welcome back. Time now for the top headlines we're tracking for you this week. In international news, German Chancellor Angela Merkel has declared she will carry out her, quote, damn duty to help refugees, despite a recent poll suggesting nine out of ten Germans want a limit on migrants entering their country. This as some refugees are buying one-way tickets home after finding Germany intolerable. I think some Germans would probably agree with you. Meantime, NATO's top commander, Philip Breedlove, told Congress this this week that refugees from the Middle East and North Africa are, quote, masking the movement of terrorists and criminals. And that burqa-clad nanny who beheaded a four-year-old in her care, parading through Moscow streets shouting, quote, I hate democracy and I am a terrorist. Well, she told officials that she did so to avenge Muslims killed in the Kremlin's campaign of airstrikes in Syria. Naturally, she is now being sent for psychiatric testing so that officials might better understand her motives. You can't make this stuff up, people. And the head of Iran's atomic energy organization said that since Iran doesn't recognize Israel as a state, it can't be a threat to Iran. 
problem solved. People were worried. And in the U.S., Donald Trump dominated Super Tuesday, notching seven victories, four more than his closest competitor, Ted Cruz. Now GOP losers like Mitt Romney are crawling back from the woodwork to distance the party from the Donald. And closer to home, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's brother, Sasha, is lobbying federal liberals to allow Algerian-born terrorist suspect Mohamed Harkat to stay in Canada. Sasha cited the government's sunny ways in arguing the suspected terrorist sleeper agent is not a threat to public safety. Rest easy. And the federal government is preparing to impose a national price on carbon if Canada's premiers fail to come to an agreement on their own. A senior official close to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said the Liberal government campaigned on environmental change and wanted a majority. So there. And rather than slam win for her cap and trade tax, which will hasten the slide of thousands into energy poverty, progressive conservatives in Ontario say they are willing to consider carbon pricing. That according to leader Patrick Brown. And for folks heading to the party convention this week in Ottawa, a climate change policy will be discussed. So have fun pulling the party leftward ho. All right, don't touch that keyboard, your quote of honor. That's next. So open-minded that the brains have fallen out. What's the point that you're making? The point that I'm making is that if you're going to propose a massive overhaul to the way the economy is, is developed in terms of carbon tax, cap and trade, other forms like that, it helps to have some science that is in fact settled. We've heard you loud and clear. You can't get enough Canadian conservative news and opinion. Why not check out our blog? It's all your favorite conservative bloggers together on a page called The Megaphone. Go to the rebel.media slash The Megaphone or click on the Megaphone menu from our main page to check it out. Welcome back. All right, before we let you go, time for your quote of honor. This one from President Ronald Reagan. Welfare's purpose should be to eliminate, as far as possible, the need for its own existence. Well, folks, I'd say in this country and south of the 49th, we've pretty much got it backwards, at least when it comes to Reagan's vantage point. All right, until next week, God bless. And remember, we got your six.